Welcome back to The Emily Show. After last week's podcast, I thought we would be moving on from all things Sean Puffy Combs. But then news broke on Friday, April 4th, that his son was being sued. And once I got my hands on that lawsuit, I knew there was stuff that we needed to talk about. Plus, there's quite a lot of legal filings going on in the Little Rod lawsuit that I covered last week on The Emily Show. And we need to cover that too because the plaintiff's lawyer has been sent to the grievance committee in a filing by another judge in a case with this same plaintiff's attorney. And that has now been filed in the Little Rod suit. And there are articles covering what's going on. All of the lawyers are making statements to the media. And because that order by the court talks about these lawsuits being filed, the federal judge said, quote, a reasonable inference from Blackburn's behavior, and that is the defense attorney, is that he inappropriately filed cases in federal court to garner media attention, embarrass defendants with salacious allegations, and pressure defendants to settle quickly. Indeed, his submissions to this court have been rife with disturbing allegations against defendants and defense counsel. So we need to have a conversation about how that is going to play in to the course of litigation in the civil litigation. Of course, that is not going to be uh, an issue with regard to any potential criminal investigations because this attorney and his filings in the civil cases do not undo things that are factual and found in the criminal allegations if we see criminal charges filed. But there is much to talk about and we should just get into it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Thank you to today's sponsor, Tushy. Tushy is the bidet that you didn't know you couldn't live without until you try it. What's fantastic is that every Hello Tushy bidet comes with a 30-day hassle-free return and 12-month warranty. Not only is it easy to use, but I wish I had had this when I was going through my spinal fusion recovery when things were a little more difficult to do. And, you know, I'm a girly that loves the long, long nails. And um, if you've ever wondered, but how do they with a bidet. That's how they. So it is time to discover the wonderful freshness of Hello Tushy's bidet. Leave the bathroom feeling as though you never even went. Join the 3 million butts who have already made the switch to Tushy. For a limited time, Emily Show listeners get 10% off your entire order with code LONARD at hellotushy.com. That's 10% off your order at H-E-L-L-O-T-U-S-H-Y.com with promo code Lawnard. Let's get back to today's episode. The first thing I want to cover today is this new lawsuit because it is against both Sean Combs and his son. It is filed by the same plaintiff attorney that filed the Little Rod lawsuit in addition to another Los Angeles-based attorney. This one is filed in the Superior Court of Los Angeles, not in federal court, not in New York like the other lawsuit is filed. I'm going to break down what we learned from this lawsuit. We see echoes from other civil lawsuits. And again, we are going to go over the new filings in the Little Rod case and talk about all of the lawyers having everything to say between each other and how this is already getting uh, quite feisty between all of the attorneys. But I will note with all of that, there are now multiple lawsuits and a criminal investigation there have been no arrests of Sean Combs or any members of his family. There have not been criminal charges brought. Civil allegations are just that at this point. They are allegations. And when we talk about lawsuits being allegations and shade, uh, this lawsuit does not hold back on the shade. And we're going to talk about that from the photos they choose to include in the lawsuit, which we saw also in the Little Rod lawsuit, to the way that things are phrased. This lawsuit is written knowing it will be headline grabbing, and I am not going to make a judgment call on that one way or another because we are seeing more and more lawsuits written in a way that grab headlines and grab attention. It is not just 
this attorney or these lawsuits that have done that. This has been uh, quite a trend in civil filings that we see those details pulled out in more detail in lawsuits that can be easily understood by the media. They are not bare bones filings that have enough to pass a motion to dismiss and not much more. It seems to me written with an awareness that there will be attention paid to these. But we saw that in the Lizzo lawsuits. We saw that all the way back in the Toddy Westbrook lawsuits and others. It's not a new phenomenon by any means. So as we get into the allegations and shade of it all, I think it was important to remember that they are allegations and shade. And as we get into the other allegations and the court's order with regard to plaintiff's counsel, plaintiff's counsel has uh, made comment to billboard, which we will get into, but saying essentially this has nothing to do with the current lawsuits that are ongoing. And I will let you decide what you think about that, but it's only fair, I think, to present the filings coming in from both sides of a thing, and then to let you decide for yourself what you think about the thing. And that's what we're gonna do today. So let's get into this filing. This is brought by plaintiff Grace O'Markey. I went through multiple media reports to figure out if this was the proper pronunciation of the plaintiff's last name, which is O apostrophe M-A-R-C-A-I-G-H. I hope so. I am also very neurospicy and dyslexic. So though I try very hard with last names, I always feel bad when I get them wrong. Uh, and this is, again, Plaintiff Grace Omarque versus Christian Combs, Sean Combs, Jane Doe's, and John Doe's, uh, 1 through 10, and ABC Corporations 1 through 10. The ABC Corporations being essentially Doe Corporations that will be named later. The complaint for damages was filed in the Los Angeles County Superior Court on April 4th, 2024 at 9.37 p.m. is the filing stamp, which is why I think we started hearing rumblings of this on Friday the 5th, though I did not see this filing myself until over the weekend, and I am recording this on April 8th. You know, we've all survived the eclipse. Spoilers, she chooses Edward. No! I posted some pictures of the eclipse um, over on my Instagram that I took from where we had a 95% totality. But I loved all of the Twilight memes during this eclipse season. Uh, they delighted me. So as we get into this complaint, we are not going to go through every detail of all of the things alleged. We are going to go over some of the newer things that we learned from this lawsuit and the legal allegations or the legal things that are complained of here count one being assault count two battery count three sexual assault count four premises liability count five aiding and abetting count six intentional infliction of emotional distress iied count seven negligent infliction of emotional distress nied and the premises liability is what we saw in the little rod lawsuit as well this premises liability relates to sean combs renting the yacht and being responsible for that premises and responsible for keeping those on the premises safe and as it's alleged here failing to do so it then goes in to list the parties and talks about grace o marquis being a female who works as a stewardess in the yachting industry and has since 2018 who loves yachting and has traveled throughout the world yachting and has always worked well in teams and received high praises from managers and colleagues. It says prior to being sexually assaulted by defendant Christian Combs, plaintiff planned to work the entirety of her career in hospitality and yachting. Unfortunately, those plans have been derailed due to the trauma plaintiff continues to have as a result of the assault. And then they include a photo of Christian King Combs. They put King in quotations. I don't know if this is a middle name or a nickname. And then they include a photo of him um being detained during the raids on sean combs's homes and it's interesting to me that the photo is very clearly watermarked with tmz's watermark in this lawsuit i didn't think we'd see a tmz watermarked photo in the lawsuit but we're on page two and here we are it goes on to say that defendant c combs is a 25 year old auto-tuned and heavily edited rapper Unfortunately, as the saying has it, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Yes, that's how the party is described in this lawsuit. 
It says defendant Sean Combs, who has been accused of several acts of sexual assault, rape, sexual violence, and drugging, among other deplorable conduct, is the father of defendant C. Combs, who was seemingly taken after his father and the family business of reckless partying, drugging others, sexual violence, and other illegal conduct. It says that specifically defendant C. Combs is the second child of billionaire defendant Sean Combs and his late partner, Kim Porter. Upon information and belief, defendant Seacombs resides in the city of Beverly Hills, California, in Los Angeles County, California. It then goes on to describe Sean Combs with his stage names, Puff Daddy, Puffy, P. Diddy, Diddy, Brother Love, or Love. It then gives a brief background of defendant Combs and the other defendants. It briefly states jurisdiction that this it happened within the state and then gets into the facts common to all causes of action and that in july 2022 grace was working on victorious which is a super yacht and that she had worked as a second stewardess for a company that staffs that super yacht in december 2022 she and her team were advised that the yacht has been chartered for the 2022 holiday period it says that she changed her personal holiday plans to accommodate the charter service and flew to saint martin to prepare the yacht for service that she learned the client who chartered the yacht was Sean Combs and family. She alleges that Sean Combs leased the yacht and had full control over the staff and premises of the yacht. She said plaintiff was used to working in discreet and VIP environments. This was her first time working with a quote unquote, A-list celebrity. It said because of this plaintiff and the rest of the team assigned to the yacht were determined to make the holidays special for defendant Combs and the family. She was assigned to the late shift, which was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and said that it was busy that late shift duties included dinner and drink service for the clients for the entirety of a 12-hour period dinner and drink service had to be carried out with minimum staff support or backup during the night shift since only two individuals were assigned it said that puffy was typically on the yacht but the sons were staying in a luxury villa nearby but joined the family aboard the yacht most evenings it also then goes on to allege that during the second week of the charter things started to change and there was a significant amount of partying and drug use, which caused the guests to stay up late and throughout the night. It goes on to allege that there was a constant rotation of suspected sex workers and other A-list celebrities such as French Montana and Cuba Gooding Jr. And then goes on to say that what was sold as a wholesome family excursion had turned into a hedonistic environment. The complaint makes specific note that this plaintiff had worked as a bartender and quote, understands the impact of alcohol and the likelihood that a person would not generally become intoxicated following one mixed drink. Because of this, plaintiff found it very suspicious that after one shot of De Leon tequila or one mixed drink, various women on the yacht would be falling over themselves, panicking or passed out. This led plaintiff to reasonably believe that the alcohol given to these women was likely laced with drugs. Again, that mirrors what is in the Little Rod lawsuit. It then goes on and references that Little Rod was on standby for musical recordings often late into the night and that there was a recording studio on this yacht, which we also heard in the Little Rod lawsuit. It then talked about Christian Combs coming onto the yacht and wanting to be in the studio and that once in the studio, defendant Christian Combs asked the plaintiff to bring shots to the recording studio and that plaintiff obliged and was the only serving steward at the time. It alleges plaintiff noticed immediately that he was particularly attentive with her, which she considered very inappropriate. It then alleges that as plaintiff was trying to leave, defendant Christian Combs insisted that she stay and chat and sit beside him, and she resisted and remained polite, asking to leave, and that defendant C. Combs became aggressive and insisted that she take a further shot and sit beside him. At that point, she alleges that he violently grabbed her arm and began hurting her and pulled her beside him to prevent her from getting up. It that goes on that she started feeling the effect of the tequila shot and suspected that the shot was spiked and was concerned about the situation, which then escalated to the point where she was physically assaulted and groped. And then she talks about the fact that the timeline gets a little difficult because of the effect of the tequila, which she believes was spiked. But it then goes on to talk about the fact that Little Rod had been recording everything, and they say that there are audio recordings of defendant C. Combs forcing plaintiff to consume the suspected laced shots, and then they go through a transcript 
of the audio recording that they labeled audio recording one and two with plaintiff saying, no, I'm not doing shots, Christian. And Christian Combs saying, everybody take a shot. The transcript they say of audio recording two talks about them going back and forth, taking a shot and her saying no. And plaintiff saying, are you drugging me? And C. Combs saying, take a shot. Hey, yo, play another beat one time. And then plaintiff saying that she needed to swap out with, it seems another crew member and him saying, no, who's going to replace you. You're the best one on this ship. And her saying, excuse me, you don't touch my legs like that. I'll move my legs where I want to. And him saying, if I want to do this, then I will. And then her saying, if I want to do this, then I will. You don't touch my legs like this. And then him saying, listen, you and everybody on the crew, it's great. And she says, I can't, I have to go down. I have to go down, um, which I assume she is referring to below deck. And he says, like, say you're just vibing with me the whole time. And she said, I can't, I promise you, I wish I could, but I can't unless I say you guys requested me. And he's like, yeah, who can we talk to? Who can we talk to right now? And she said, well, you can take your hand off my ass for the first thing. And then she alleges that the person they would have requested was asleep. And so this was more of a ruse so that she could get away and that she was attempting to leave the situation and get away from him. But that by the time she got out of the situation, another colleague recognized that she was intoxicated and in shock and trying to finish her shift. It says that defendant Combs was looking for her and demanding that she find him a place to sleep on the yacht and that she found him a place in the cinema room and that after she escorted him there, he blocked her in, prevented her from exiting and further started to grope her and expose himself. She then includes photos of her like wrist area that appear to be bruised in the photographs and included those into a description of how she was uh, grabbed by the arms. The suit then goes on to talk about the severe psychological impact the alleged assault had. It then gets into the premises liability and Sean Combs chartering the yacht, the environment of the yacht, what was allowed to take place on the yacht, noting that on one occasion, the assistant, uh, Christina Corum, instructed the plaintiff to ensure that the entire bar area was stocked with De Leon tequila and Ciroc vodka, and that Sean Combs, it was important that he be surrounded by those bottles, even when visibly intoxicated. They then talk about other uh, celebrities that were coming off and on the yacht, but much like the Little Rod lawsuit, the celebrities are redacted. And then there are like hints as to who they are in the footnotes of the lawsuits. The plaintiff notes that she had had interactions with Brendan Paul, and we talked about him in the last podcast episode. He is the individual who had been arrested for possession of narcotics in Miami at the executive private jet airport. And in this lawsuit, it then alleges that he is a, quote, noted drug mule, end quote, but talks about an interaction with him where Puffy had forced him to stay in the room while he was engaged in sexual activity with multiple women. And the plaintiff was like, why would you want to work for him? And he said he was a good link to have in the industry. They then talked about other A-listers that were off and on of the yacht during this period of time. Everyone except Cuba Gooding Jr. is redacted with footnotes, again, saying things like a 25-year-old British rapper. And then they get to the different causes of action, the first one being assault, and they relist what happened during that alleged assault. The second one being battery, again, re-alleging what happened with the forcible grabbing the third cause of action being the sexual assault which combines the things in the other two causes of action and those allegations and adding more detail to that the fourth cause of action is the premises liability against sean combs not his son talking about the environment he was in control of and created and facilitated that during the period of time on the ship other things had happened on the ship people getting into physical fights, the narcotic use, and on and on, and that that was an environment of mayhem so that he should have known that this could easily happen because of the things that had happened on board. It also, throughout the lawsuit, 
talks about the fact that when the plaintiff reported this to the yacht captain, the yacht captain derided the plaintiff and then was given a very large tip by Sean Combs at the end of this charter. The fifth cause of action is aiding and abetting against Sean Combs, saying that he encouraged and fostered an environment and culture to his son and his employees, that they could do whatever they want with the plaintiff and the other yacht staff, that he provided drugs and alcohol to be used to take advantage of women on the yacht, including plaintiff, and that Sean Combs knew that plaintiff had been assaulted because he quote unquote paid off the yacht captain after hearing plaintiff's complaints regarding his son defendant C. Combs. And then the causes of action for the intentional infliction of emotional distress and the negligent infliction of emotional distress. Of note, they do talk about an instance on the yacht where Hulu was filming, which I thought was uh, unique because I wonder how many subpoenas we will see to Hulu given that this two week trip on the yacht over the holidays of 2022 are now factoring into two civil lawsuits. But during that incident, the plaintiff notes that Hulu was filming, that Combs and friends were playing a game, and Combs was dared to expose himself and did in fact expose himself while sitting next to his mother on the yacht, and that plaintiff returned to the pantry on the yacht and refused to stand outside while that was happening. So while at least some of this was going on. There were Hulu cameras there. Did Hulu cameras pick up Puffy exposing himself while sitting next to his mom on a yacht in like the US Virgin Islands? I, what is even happening? But I imagine that the uh, the subpoenas to Hulu will absolutely happen given everything alleged, not only in this lawsuit, but also in the Little Rod lawsuit. And speaking of the Little Rod lawsuit, we need to talk about the filings that are happening in that suit and what all of the lawyers have had to say, because all of them have had, or seemingly all of them have had something to say. So as we take a look to what's going on between all of the lawyers, first, we're going to go to a billboard article, breaking all of this down with the statements by the lawyers. This is from April 4th, 2024. The headline being the lawyer behind the Diddy sexual abuse case criticized by judge over pattern of quote unquote salacious case filings. Quote, a judge says Tyrone Blackburn, legal counsel in a high profile case against Sean Combs, well, multiple now, aimed to quote unquote embarrass defendants with quote unquote salacious allegations. It says an attorney who filed one of the several sexual abuse lawsuits against Sean Diddy Combs is now facing potential discipline himself after a federal judge in another case sharply criticized him for filing suits designed to, quote, garner media attention and, quote, embarrass defendants. In an order issued Wednesday, April 3rd, in a separate lawsuit, Judge Denise Cote, Cote, C-O-T-E, referred Tyrone Blackburn to the Grievance Committee for New York's Federal Court District, an entity that decides whether attorneys have violated court rules. She cited his conduct in five different lawsuits, saying that his filings in those cases featured glaring deficiencies. We're gonna get into that filing because it's now been filed in the Little Rod lawsuit. In an email to Billboard on Thursday, Blackburn said, quote, not sure how this is at all relevant to the Rodney Jones case or any other case I have. This will not have any impact on my ability to proceed in Mr. Jones's case, although Judge Cote's decision was a referral to the SDNY's grievance committee and not a sanction, I plan on appealing the decision. The article goes on to say Blackburn has already faced scrutiny over accusations filed on Jones's behalf. In her response to the lawsuit, Combs's attorney, Sean Holly, took the unusual step of calling out her opposing counsel by name, saying that Blackburn had, quote, ignored evidence of Combs's innocence before filing the case. Quote, our attempts to share this proof with Mr. Jones's attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, have been ignored as Mr. Blackburn refuses to return our calls, Holly said at the time. Quote, we will address these outlandish allegations in court and take all appropriate action against those who make them. It goes on to say last week, attorneys for UMG took similar aim at Blackburn, arguing that Grange, the CEO of UMG, had, quote, utterly nothing to do end quote, with the allegations against Diddy, 
The label's lawyer said that the claims are so offensively false that they would seek to punish Blackburn himself for filing them. Quote, a license to practice law is a privilege, wrote Donald Zacharin, a longtime music industry litigator who represents UMG and Grange. Quote, Mr. Blackburn, plaintiff's lawyer, has misused that license to self-promote gratuitously, falsely, and recklessly accusing the UMG defendants of criminal behavior. UMG's filing last week said the company would seek legal sanctions against Blackburn under Federal Rule 11, which we are going to look at in just a moment. So in an effort to cover the full breadth of what's going on between the lawyers in the Little Rod lawsuit, we are going to go to the first of three letter filings. This is letter from counsel for the UMG defendants. Then we're going to get to the response from Little Rod's attorney Blackburn, and then we are going to get to the final filing, which includes the court order. These are going to be overviews. Don't worry, we're not going to be here for four hours. These are going to be overviews. Sometimes covering court cases and live trials can uh, make me sweat just a little bit. I know you guys have seen it happen on stream, but thanks to today's sponsor, Lumi, body odor is handled. Lumi is the whole body deodorant that you can use from your pits to your feet and everything in between. It's powered by mandelic acid to deliver outrageous 72-hour odor control, and you can pick not only the scent, but the form you would like your deodorant to come in, from the deodorant stick to deodorant cream, body wipes, or body wash, all that help make sure that no matter what, you are smelling fresh. And as always, it is baking soda and paraben free, and you can choose from lavender sage, toasted coconut, or clean tangerine. My boys love the sage. I love the tangerine, but you guys can mix and match. And that's really easy to do with the starter pack, which is perfect for new customers. And as a special offer for our listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine that 15% off with the already discounted starter pack, that equals 40% off the starter pack. Use code LAWNERD for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T.com. Let's get back to today's episode. And remember, New York does things by letter filing. So this is a letter filing from Prior Cashman LLP, the lawyers for the UMG defendants. It says, we are counsel for defendants UMG Recordings, Inc., erroneously sued as Universal Music Group, Motown Records, and Sir Lucian Grange, collectively the UMG defendants. We respectfully write in response to the March 27th letter from plaintiff's counsel, Tyrone Blackburn ESQ. Mr. Blackburn complains about the UMG defendants' sua sponte waiver of service, of process, and filing of a Rule 12b6 motion to dismiss all claims them asserted. I think that is then. That is a typo. Then asserted in plaintiff's amended complaint dated March 2nd, 2024, the FAC, the first amendment complaint. Remember, when I covered this last week, we were covering a proposed second amended complaint. This is arguing over that because the UMG defendants had filed a motion to dismiss the first amended complaint, and then plaintiff's counsel filed a second amended complaint, and then the court said, you can't just do that. You need leave of court to file it. So this is part of the complaints about the filing of that second amended complaint. They say to the court, having filed a complaint making baseless accusations of criminal behavior against the UMG defendants on February 26, 2024, over one month ago, Mr. Blackburn has made no effort to serve process. It appears that Mr. Blackburn believes that unjustly accused defendants should be powerless to respond to such a pleading. The UMG defendants were absolutely entitled to waive service of process under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4D instead of allowing Blackburn to endlessly file unauthorized pleadings in his unilateral game of pleading, quote unquote, whack-a-mole. Perhaps he believes he can make outrageously false allegations in a pleading, never serve them, let them marinate in the press for a month, and then completely abandon them, file equally false and legally baseless claims on completely different accusations, and there is, quote, no harm, no foul. They say there is harm and there is foul, and that is why the UMG defendants motion addresses. So they are saying that they waived service of process to file the motion to dismiss so that these claims wouldn't quote unquote marinate in the press for a month. And that Blackburn was objecting to them doing so and then filed this leave for the second amended complaint. They say in his unauthorized SAC, SAC, Second Amendment Complaint, Mr. Blackburn has jettisoned every one of the FACs, 
first amendment complaints, foundational allegations against the UMG defendants, in parentheses, improperly filed twice now without leave of this court and without bothering to identify the changes he has made to the FAC. They're just pointing out the procedural defects as well. They say the FAC included the completely unfounded allegations that one, that A, plaintiff supposedly personally saw Sir Lucian Charles Grange attend Combs' alleged sex trafficking parties and also saw Ethiopia Habtermerium there. In the second amended complaint, Habtermerium is dismissed entirely. And in the uh, docket now of the lawsuit, it shows that Habtermerium is completely dismissed from these lawsuits. B, that Motown Records is supposedly liable under the doctrine of respondeat superior as the quote unquote parent company of co-defendant Love Records, which is Combs's record label. And C, UMG recordings in Motown supposedly funded Combs's alleged sex trafficking parties with quote unquote bags of cash. They then go on to say that every one of these foundational allegations for the claims against the UMG defendants have been wiped from the second amended complaint, along with one of the claims he asserted against Motown Records for California premises liability. So then they talk about the fact that when they filed the motion to dismiss, then a second amended complaint was filed and that the second amended complaint removes the allegations that were being complained of. It then goes on to say, further, since Sir Lucian Grange has never been to any of Mr. Combs's homes, the plaintiff's assertion in the FAC that he personally saw Sir Lucian Grange disappear with Mr. Combs into Mr. Combs' room for hours can only be either a delusion or a lie, since the exact same allegation is made in the FAC as to Miss Haptomerium, who also was never at any of Mr. Combs's homes after plaintiff was supposedly hired by Mr. Combs, it seems fairly clear that it was no delusion, but it was a lie. They go on to accuse plaintiff's counsel of swapping out the different claims and just moving things around. The response to this from plaintiff's counsel was filed on March 28th after the raids on Sean Combs's homes. And more information about the raids is learned through this filing and the second amended complaint is attached to this filing. And that's what we went over last week. It says to the court, plaintiff respectfully requests leave to amend as the amendment is being made pursuant to the 21 safe harbor rule of what plaintiff viewed as a demand or amend or withdraw. Federal rule of civil procedure provides that a party may amend a pleading quote once as a matter of course within 21 days of receiving a responsive pleading under rule 12B. If 21 days have passed since the filing of the pleading, a party may amend the pleading only with the opposing party's written consent or the court's leave. So plaintiff is saying he believes that because he filed the first amended complaint and then the defense filed a 12B6 motion to dismiss, that then he has 21 days under Rule 12B to file the second amended complaint without leave from the court. He then goes on to say, it is clear from the second amended pleading that the defendants either negligently or intentionally funded the activities of defendant Sean Combs. Before filing his pleading, plaintiff had only the word of Mr. Combs, the evidence in his possession and his personal experience living with Mr. Combs from September 2022 to November 2023. It goes on to say, Ms. Haptomerium's declaration provided plaintiff with the confirmation he needed concerning the business partnership and the funding of the love album that Mr. Combs had shared with plaintiff directly. It is also clear that many of the claims raised by plaintiff in his second amended pleading are accurate as the events of March 25th, 2024 have revealed. One, Mr. Combs's drug mule, Brandon Paul, was arrested in Miami, Florida for cocaine possession and the cocaine was in his carry-on luggage as plaintiff stated in his amended pleading. Two, Mr. Combs is being investigated for possible sex trafficking as plaintiff has alleged and thoroughly detailed with exhibits and examples in his pleading and three the raid produced guns in both locations as plaintiff detailed in his pleadings so then plaintiff's counsel is striking back at the allegations from defense counsel that the claims going to umg are baseless i don't know if it helps pointing these three things out because these three things don't seem to tie directly to UMG, but they do tie to things that have since happened 
or that have happened since the complaint has been filed showing that the things alleged in the complaint seem to track with the things going on currently. He then goes on and says, as detailed in the letter dated March 27th, 2024, plaintiff determined that UMG and Motem Records had a general business partnership based on his conversations with Mr. Combs and the public statements made by defendants on their websites or on their LinkedIn business pages in the relevant part, the defendant's website states as follows. And then it has a number of statements about Diddy and Motown partnering up and Love Records and Motown Records with like a handshaking emoji. Diddy's new album will be the first release from Love Records in partnership with Motown, et cetera. It then goes on to say, the defendant's pearl clutching is breathtaking. Defendants knew for years that Mr. Combs had a propensity for violence. As detailed in the amended complaint, Mr. Combs assaulted their former executive, Steve Stout. According to former UMG executive Steve Stout, quote, Combs and two men barged into his New York office and attacked him with a champagne bottle. Combs was charged with second degree assault and criminal mischief. UMG knew this and did not end their business partnership with him. In fact, they turned a blind eye and continued their business partnership for several years after the attack. It then goes on to say, if not for Cassie Ventura's November 16th, 2023 lawsuit, UMG's history of running to Mr. Combs for partnership opportunities would have continued. It goes on to say plaintiff stands by the claims raised in the first amended complaint and goes on to ask the court to allow the second amended complaint to be filed. And in response, we have an April 4th, 2022 filing to the court from the counsel for UMG pointing out the order of the other court with regard to plaintiff's counsel saying this. In connection with the telephonic hearing your honor has scheduled for April 9th, 2004, we write to bring to your honor's attention an opinion and order issued by Judge Cote, Cote, C-O-T-E, I don't know. Yesterday, April 3rd, 2024, in the case of Zunzorowski versus Fisher, a copy of which is attached here too. In the order, Judge Cote referred Mr. Blackburn to the Grievance Committee of the Southern District of New York to address what she found to be a pattern of failing to comply with his Rule 11 obligations. In an observation particularly relevant to the offensively false and salacious accusations Mr. Blackburn leveled at our clients, in parentheses saying only to abandon the accusations after having attracted press attention, swapping them out for equally false accusations, Judge Cote specifically stated, quote, a reasonable inference from Blackburn's pattern of behavior is that he improperly files cases in federal court to garner media attention, embarrass defendants with salacious allegations, and pressure defendants to settle quickly. Indeed, his submissions to this court have been rife with disturbing allegations against the defendants and defense counsel. They go on to say, so too here are Mr. Blackburn's pleadings, quote, rife with disturbing allegations against the UMG defendants. As the order states, Judge Cote issued a prior order on February 15th, 2024, requiring Mr. Blackburn to show cause why Rule 11 sanctions should not be imposed in the case before her. Yet a mere 11 days later, Blackburn filed the original complaint in this action, February 26, 2024, followed days later by the first amended complaint, March 4th, 2024, and then his several unauthorized attempts to file a second amended complaint. In every one of those filings or attempted filings in patent violation of Rule 11, Mr. Blackburn larded his pleadings with offensively and knowingly false accusations against the UMG defendants. And it is clear that he knew they were false, they go on to say, as evidenced by his having jettisoned in his proposed Second Amendment complaint every single foundational accusation he made in the original and First Amendment complaints. In my April 1st, 2024 letter to your honor opposing Blackburn's letter motion to amend, I specifically note some examples of the bad faith of plaintiff and Blackburn using an unauthorized second amended complaint to garner publicity and only then seeking leave to amend. They go on to say, while I was aware of the pending Rule 11 sanctions motion against Blackburn in the Eastern District of New York and a motion for a gag order against him brought by the Fox Rothschild firm, I was not aware of the matter pending before Judge Cote, nor of the other cases referred to in the order. It is painfully obvious that Mr. Blackburn believes he is free to flagrantly violate Rule 11 in furtherance of trying to garner press attention for himself without regard for the truth and without regard for the human consequences of his conduct. 
We have served Blackburn with a Rule 11 motion, as I said we would, but this court has the inherent power to address Blackburn's conduct, and we believe that Judge Coates' opinion and the facts set forth therein are relevant for this court's consideration. So this is all leading up to a hearing on Tuesday, April 9th. Speaking of, by the way, Rule 11, because all of you, well, all of you not in law school or lawyers or paralegals or in the legal profession are like, Emily, what is Rule 11? Well, I, I have my handy dandy federal rules of civil procedure here for you to tell you all about Rule 11. Not only do you hear about Rule 11 in regard to sanctions, because Rule 11 sanctions allow for a uh, sanction for a variety of behavior, but as relevant here for, I believe, for Rule 11, it is the uh, representations to the court by presenting to the court a pleading, written motion, or other paper, whether signing, filing, submitting, or later advocating it, an attorney or unrepresented party certifies that to the best of the person's knowledge, information, and belief, formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances, one, it is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessarily delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. Two, the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by the existing law or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing law or for establishing new law. Three, the factual contentions have evidentiary support. If any of you are thinking of quoting Legally Blonde, now would be the appropriate time to say that your claims have like evidentiary support. Or if specifically so identified, will likely have evidentiary support after a reasonable opportunity for further investigation or discovery and the denials of factual contentions are warranted on the evidence or, if specifically so identified, are reasonable based on belief or lack of information. So, mostly talking about the representations being made to a court in a pleading, essentially being grounded in, in fact and reality and having evidentiary support or that such evidentiary support is reasonable and likely. So you can't just file whatever. Thank you to our sponsor Shopify for making episodes like this and the Law Nerd Shop possible. The entire Law Nerd Shop is powered by Shopify and has been since the very beginning because they make it incredibly easy to set up your shop, whether you're selling in person or online or somewhere in between. And it doesn't matter what phase of business you're at, whether you're just getting started, whether you're opening a brick and mortar location, or whether you're pushing past your first million sales. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, no matter what you're selling. From laundered mugs to your favorite nail polish to Rothy's or Allbirds, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Plus, Shopify has award-winning help that is there to support your success every step of the way. And with the internet's best converting checkout, you will be turning browsers into buyers with ease. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash lawnard. Remember, that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lawnard now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. And start hearing this sound soon. It's no wonder that businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. I know mine has. Let's get back to today's episode. We're going to look very briefly into this court's opinion and order, but a lot of this surrounds other cases. This is all happening in other cases. And a lot of it has to do with diversity jurisdiction. So also, just go ahead. Miss Kensington, did diversity jurisdiction exist in this case? No, it did not. The things you learn about 1L from Legally Blonde cannot be underestimated or understated. But a lot of the cases, and there are five that the judge takes issue with this attorney Blackburn's behavior center around jurisdiction in federal court, which is something that when I cover cases and we get into the 
um, allegations and the factual allegations and the causes of actions, claims or charges, we often move through the jurisdictional bit until we get into the briefing, but it is the first stop in any lawsuit that there has to be proper jurisdiction, whether it is in federal court or in state court and in federal court, there is more nuance to how you have jurisdiction, what jurisdiction is proper. So it is a very important legal foundation to each case that can have a tremendous amount of nuance and it can cause cases to be yeeted out of court, like go file it in the proper court. For all of you just yelling international shoe right now, yeah, yes. <laughs> this is from the court's opinion and order. Plaintiff filed this legal malpractice action on December 14th, 2023 against defendant attorneys um, Fisher and Tobinfeld. These, again, this is a separate case that has nothing to do with Diddy. This has everything to do with this lawyer's other cases and this judge putting their foot down. Counsel did so after being advised by defense counsel that complete diversity of citizenship did not exist because the plaintiff and the defendant are both domiciled in New Jersey. You cannot file a diversity jurisdiction case where there is not complete diversity of the parties, meaning everybody's got to be from somewhere else. Diversity jurisdiction, you don't even go here. <laughs> It then talks about the back and forth between the attorneys proving that he knew that there was not jur diversity jurisdiction and then continuing with the case, even though the law firm was also being sued and that the law firm is an LLP, but the residency of the LLP is made up of the residency of the partners. So you can't just dismiss one of the partners because there's no diversity and then say it's fine because there's still no diversity as to the law firm. So nuanced diversity arguments in the case. On February 15th, the court in that case directed plaintiff's counsel to show why Rule 11 sanctions should not be imposed for the failure to conduct a reasonable inquiry into the defendant's citizenship prior to filing the complaint in the action. The order also listed by docket number five other actions that Blackburn had filed in this district that had been dismissed for lack of jurisdiction or transferred or dismissed for lack of venue. In the letter of February 16th, Blackburn asserted that he had researched the addresses of the defendants in the instant action by using a Lexus Nexus people search, which showed the attorney's residence at 225 Broadway. He added that the search of the records of the New York Department and State Division of Corporation showed that the law firm is a New York limited liability partnership, right? The address is the law firm's address. There was then a conference and more conversation about the fact that the address is clearly the law firm's address, not the residence of the party. The discussion, the court says, Blackburn has, as he admits, failed to meet his Rule 11 obligations in this case. It appears that this is part of a pattern. The court declines to impose sanctions pursuant to Rule 11 or its inherent power, but will refer him to this court's grievance committee. There is a basis to believe that Blackburn is filing cases in this district without diligently investigating the existence of either jurisdiction or venue as required by Rule 11. It goes on to list out the rules of Civil Procedure 11B, which I have just gone over. I should have just kept reading. The court says if an attorney alleges jurisdiction, quote, when reasonable inquiry would show that it did not exist, he may be held liable for sanctions substantial in amount. As this course advised Blackburn, it, quote, may enforce Rule 11 even after the plaintiff has filed a notice of dismissal under Rule 41A1. So the court warned this attorney, look, just because you dismissed the party doesn't mean we might not sanction you for doing it in the first place. It goes on to say that Blackburn was advised by defense counsel before he filed this action that diversity jurisdiction did not exist because defendant attorney Fisher lives in New Jersey, as does plaintiff. Blackburn had not done a reasonable investigation to satisfy his Rule 11 obligation to confirm the existence of diversity jurisdiction before that conversation, but he abjectly failed to do so after that warning. The court goes on to say this failure to conduct the investigation required by Rule 11 appears to be a pattern. In the February 15th order and the March 5th conference, this court advised Blackburn that it had identified five cases discussed below 
that he had filed in this district that were dismissed for lack of jurisdiction or because of a change of venue. An order of March 5th directed Blackburn to file a letter regarding his compliance with the requirements of Rule 11 in those cases. Blackburn's March 19th letter response to the March 5th order does not dispel this court's concerns. It then goes on to list and describe the different five cases. The court then goes on to say, just 11 days after filing the December 3rd, 2023 letter admitting he could not establish diversity in a separate action that the court's been talking about, counsel filed a complaint in the case that the court is evaluating for this order. As Blackburn admitted, he failed to comply with his Rule 11 obligations in doing so. Blackburn argues, however, that neither he nor his client gained anything by filing this case in federal instead of state court. The record in this case and the history of his other cases in this district contradict that claim. The court says at the March 5th conference, defense counsel reported that Blackburn had told her he filed this case in federal court because doing so would make the press more likely to pick up on it. A reasonable inference from Blackburn's pattern of behavior is that he improperly files cases in federal court to garner media attention, embarrass defendants with salacious allegations, and pressure defendants to settle quickly. Indeed, his submissions to this court have been rife with disturbing allegations against the defendants and defense counsel. It goes on to say Blackburn called defense counsel in this action a quote-unquote disgusting racist for rejecting his preferred mediators. In response to this court's order requiring plaintiff to submit an affidavit, quote, regarding the representation made by the plaintiff to counsel regarding Fisher's residence, Blackburn filed a wholly inappropriate 53-paragraph affidavit containing multiple irrelevant and scandalous accusations against attorney Fisher. Regardless of plaintiff's counsel Blackburn's intentions, his actions in this and prior cases indicate a repeated failure to meet his Rule 11 obligations. The court then says significant resources have been spent by judges of the court and defendants named in actions he has filed to address glaring deficiencies in his filings. A referral to this court's grievance committee is warranted. Conclusion, Tyrone a. Blackburn is referred to the grievance committee of this district for such action as it deems appropriate. So the court declined to sanction him. Other courts of the five cases that this judge listed out have declined to sanction him. Instead, all of these cases are sent together on this order to be evaluated by the committee to determine what action is appropriate. They can uh, remove your ability to practice in federal court amongst other things. So we will see what happens there. Um, However, I think this will play heavily into this civil case because the attorneys for UMG are not going to let it go. What is troubling to me about it is these plaintiffs have brought forth um, serious cases and serious cases with allegations that echo other cases. There are a number of these cases with very similar allegations across multiple plaintiffs. Does that mean they are true? No, these are all allegations at this point. But I hope that the allegations of the plaintiff aren't lost between the fighting of the attorneys in these cases. This is not going to impact the criminal case in any way. The allegations in the civil cases aren't gonna be the basis of what's going on in criminal without something further. Interviews, evidence, and Little Rod and in the latest lawsuit have alleged that things are on audio tape, on videotape and elsewhere. So hopefully the fighting with the lawyers does not sidetrack or waste time for these plaintiffs and the serious allegations that they have brought against now P. Diddy and his son, Christian Combs. We will see what happens in this. I intend to move on from this case until there is something more. But once I started seeing these filings and this order from the court, it seemed that it needed to be explored a little bit further after exploring the Little Rod lawsuit last week. I'd love to know your thoughts on all of this and your questions or concerns, but it seems that these civil cases 
might not slow down given everything. And we did learn from these filings that one, Hulu was filming on that yacht over the holidays. And I really am curious to know what they have on tape. Two, um, the media reports that there were guns removed from the residences that were searched is also stated now in a legal filing. And we've seen other things in the letter where attorney Blackburn is like, yes, they say our filing doesn't have any grounding in fact. However, we're seeing an investigation for sex trafficking. We're seeing weapons removed in a search and we are seeing the quote unquote drug mule arrested at the airport. So there were things said in that civil lawsuit that came to fruition not that long after, but does that go to the UMG defendants or not? And how hard will the UMG lawyers fight over this? I imagine the answer to that is the limit does not exist. And with that, Law Nerd, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of The Emily Show. Thank you to our sponsors to allow us to cover topics that are, um, are, are challenging, are important, and need to be discussed. So with all of it, stay hydrated, my friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful or your bidet be delightful. May your family be well. May the odds be ever in your favor. And I really hope I didn't spoil the eclipse ending for you, but I feel like Twilight's been out long enough that we can openly talk about the Bella, Edward, and uh, Jacob of it all. But with that, I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search your app store for Law Nerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.